introduce the speaker, Professor Joe Marola from Virginia Tech. He has his BS degree from Carnegie Mellon and his PhD from MIT. Joe started out at corporate research in Exxon and uh, was involved in a lot of uh, synthesis gas chemistry and uh, catalytic research. Since 1987, he's uh, been at Virginia Tech and been a faithful attendee of this conference every year. And he, uh, just three months ago, moved uh, into a position as Assistant Dean for Research and Outreach in the College of Arts and Sciences, although he still maintains his chemistry research. And he could have been at two other administrative meetings today, but he chose to come here and talk about oxidative addition of pH bonds to iridium and chemistry of resulting hydrides. The other two meetings were such that I'm no fool. I picked the one that was going to be more interesting. So I, I'd like to thank Pat especially for putting me in an extremely enviable position sandwiched in between a former student and a present student, which gives me the capability of telling stories with impunity about each because the former student does, is gone from the podium, so he doesn't have the, have the opportunity anymore to get up and tell stories about me in public. And the current student knows that I have yet to sign his thesis, and so he knows he better not tell any stories. But following the exhortation of a former president to be kinder and gentler, I won't do that today. And instead, I will focus on the chemistry. And the title here really is the same in concept than what I had in the program. But it really, I wanted to focus on this idea that when we're interested in catalysis, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to break and remake bonds, break bonds of those things that we don't want and put them back together in the ways that we do want. And I think one of the things that I'd like to point out that is in terms of organometallic chemistry, what we have to offer is number one, certainly in terms of our own personal goals, is that we would like to develop some new homogeneous catalysts, either selectivities that cannot be achieved with current ones, or new kinds of chemistry, new kinds of addition that we can't uh, get to. But secondly, I think there is an overall broader message in terms of organometallic chemistry, is that many times what we can do is we can offer some insight as to what might be happening on surfaces in perhaps heterogeneous systems that may not be as easily obtainable with some of the features that we have to look at surfaces. So we're in, I think, the enviable position that we can get molecular structure with a lot of organometallic complexes that cannot be obtained with the current techniques that we have to look at surfaces. And so perhaps we can give some information about what might be happening there. If we go back to the title that I actually put into the abstract, what we're really talking about is that E just stands for any element. And if we take a look at current catalytic processes, that adding EH bonds to metals and then using those fragments further for reaction chemistry is a common theme in terms of HH addition in hydrogenation catalysis. HH also plays an important role in hydroformylation catalysis. SIH plays an important role in hydroformylation chemistry. HC in hydrocyanation. And there are other examples that we can talk about, but these are certainly some of the most important ones in terms of homogeneous catalysis. And so when I began looking at some iridium chemistry, this is actually some thoughts that began when I was still at Exxon. What I was interested in doing is seeing if we can develop an iridium system that we could use to not only understand these systems at some greater length, but also to develop some new additions and hopefully to use those additions in catalytic cycles. And so to summarize quite a bit of the work that's happening over the last 10 years that I've been at uh, Virginia Tech, is that we develop this extremely electron-rich iridium complex. So it's an iridium with a cyclooctadiene ligand, three trimethylphosphine ligands. And to give you an idea of how electron-rich this is, is, even though it's cationic, this has a basicity about equivalent to purity. So it is a very basic metal center. And that electron richness allows us to add to it quite a lot of EH bonds. And so we've demonstrated CH bond addition to this metal complex, boron hydrogen bond addition, HH addition, OH addition, NH addition, and actually lots of other variants of these things. And so in the talk following mine, Marion Franks is going to show you pathways that actually diverge from this particular point. And he's going to talk a lot more about catalysis 
that I'm going to specifically talk about. But what I thought that I would do today, in, in light of a lot of the interest of some of the other folks, in terms of looking at um, heterogeneous catalysis in the petroleum industry, what I would look at is the chemistry of this species with aromatics and heteroaromatics, and to see what kinds of reaction chemistry that we'll get with it, and then following that first step, where perhaps we'll have this EH addition, what further chemistry can we do with these things that will perhaps lead us to some new catalyses? I'd like to put my acknowledgement slide up front, since many times in our zeal to get in the last little bit of chemistry, we, we sometimes let this one slide. But I'd like to acknowledge all of my students in the past for their efforts in these different areas. And specifically today, I'm going to talk about the work of a PhD student, Henry Selnow, two master's students, um, Art Grieb and Robert Clark, as well as two undergraduates, uh, Debbie Driscoll and Dave Hobart, in terms of the chemistry. And the funding of this initially came from a private foundation in Virginia known as the Jeffers Trust, and then followed by some funding by the National Science Foundation and the Petroleum Research Fund of the American Chemical Society. So I'd like to start this idea of looking at the chemistry of this with the simplest of the aromatics, the chemistry of this with benzene. And what we see here is that heating of this trisphosphine iridium COD complex with benzene uh, leads to carbon-hydrogen bond addition to the metal center, and we obtain this phenyl hydrido complex. Now, a lot of the compounds that we've looked at, we will do x-ray crystallography on. That isn't necessarily to do characterization, even though it's a very nice confirmation of characterization, because many times various proton and phosphorus NMR spectroscopies really allow us to nail down the identification. But even though I'm not going to talk about some of these things at length today, I'll only show one example. The main impetus for doing X-ray crystallography is to take a look at the metrics, bond lengths and angles, because they actually give us some insights as to what may be happening with the electronic structures of these molecules that help us to understand their chemistry. But in this particular case, we can see the phenyl, the hydrogen, and what happens um, in a practical sense is the cyclooctadiene ring falls off, the chloride, which was a counterion in the cationic complex, comes in and is now joined to the metal, and now that CH bond adds to give us these octahedral metal complexes. One of the things that we discovered is that these trimethylphosphine ligands are extremely tightly bound to these metal compounds. We have an octahedral metal complex, and so if we want to see any further reaction chemistry, all of the sites are completely taken up. And so if we want to bring in some new reagents for some further chemistry, we're going to have to lose something. These three phosphines are very tightly bound. We don't want to lose the two things that we've just added. And so that ultimately leads the chloride as the only ligand that is available for loss in terms of further reaction chemistry. That chloride doesn't come off thermally, but we, it, what we've been able to do is to remove that chloride using some reagent such as silver or thallium, which precipitates the very insoluble silver or thallium chloride. If we replace this with a PF6 salt, which is much more weakly coordinating, in the presence of something like an alkyne, this example is 2-butyne, what happens is, is that we obtain this methyl allyl iridium trimethylphosphine phenyl compound. What's happening in this particular case, which we can study by using deuterium labeling, is the following. Upon removal of this chloride, what happens is, is this alkyne can come in and insert into the metal deuterium bond. This is still a coordinatively unsaturated pattern. It doesn't show the positive charge there, but it should be there. And so this really wants to obtain coordinative saturation. And so what it does is it actually does a beta hydrogen elimination from this methyl group, forming this allene hydride. This hydrogen, then, if it back adds to this point in the double bond, just is a um, non-productive back and forth reaction there. But if it ultimately adds to the central bond, we get a very stable allyl formation. And this is a coordinatively saturated, very stable complex, and it stops at that particular point. And so the question was, if our substrate doesn't have this ability to rearrange into an allyl, what happens? 
And so if we use T-butyl acetylene, which can't rearrange to form the allyl, what happens in this case, using the same reaction conditions, is that we get a very unusual, uh, basically, um, uh, dimerization of the two butyne, forming this butadiene fragment, sigma bonded uh, to the metal. And so what happens, we think, in this case, is that one equivalent of this comes in, inserts into the metal hydrogen bond to give us a vinyl. That can't rearrange any further. A second equivalent of acetylene comes in and also uh, gets involved in the reaction to give us this very unusual dimer. This T-butyl group actually stabilizes the metal. Even though it's still cationic, it is actually stabilized via what's known as an agostic interaction, a three-center um, two-electron bond between the carbon, hydrogen, and the metal center. And that actually stops the reaction there so that we can actually isolate this. We've actually shown that this material is a catalyst for the oligomerization of acetylenes that don't have this T-butyl blocking group. Unfortunately, these acetylenes are, uh, oligomers, are very tough to handle because they basically have this cross-conjugated feature all the way down the line and they undergo all kinds of Diels-Alder reactions and are really hard to uh, handle. And we hope to find the right intermediate between a T-butyl group, which stops the chemistry, and something else so that perhaps we can get a better handle on these compounds. So what I've done is, is gloss over lots of details of this chemistry, but try to give you an overview of what happens with this benzene and then some further reaction chemistry that we've seen. But you'll notice that in most of these cases, this phenyl group didn't participate in any of the further chemistry. The hydride did, but the phenyl didn't. And what we were interested in doing is ultimately thinking about ways of adding this on and getting this to become catalytic as a way to add CH bonds across unsaturates. But in this chemistry, we weren't able to realize that. So what we started doing was looking at lots of other aromatics and heteroaromatics to see how that chemistry would change. So if we take a look at nitrogen heteroaromatic, heteroaromatics in the case of pyridine, what we discover in this particular case is that we can also get a CH bond addition with pyridine. And there are a couple of interesting differences between the chemistry that we observed with benzene and that that we observed with pyridine. Point number one is that uh, in the case of benzene, all six CH bonds are equivalent. So that's no big deal to see the CH bond. In this particular case, we see several different types of CH bonds, and we only observe CH activation alpha to the nitrogen. We think that is tied up with the acidity of those CH bonds, is that what we're really seeing is almost an, an acid-base reaction in this particular case, and it's the most acidic CH bond that adds. We also see a difference in the regiochemistry of where the aromatic adds. Before, on that benzene, we actually saw the hydride trans to the chloride with the benzene in between. In this case, we see the pyridine trans to the chloride with the hydride in between. What that means in terms of how these things react, we're not completely certain, but clearly the pyridine probably plays a role in what's going on in terms of how it's added. Now, let's do exactly the same reaction that we did with that phenyl compound. Let's take that phenyl, or this pyridyl hydride, thallium PF6, and T-butyl acetylene to keep the acetylene reagent exactly the same. In this particular case, what we get now is a very unusual diacetylide in which the iridium sits in the middle here, and we've got a T-butyl acetylide on this side, a T-butyl acetylide on that side, and we've got a protonated pyridine there. We're not 100% certain as to what's going on here, but what we have noted is that this nitrogen, in being attached to this iridium, actually becomes hyperbasic. It becomes much more basic. Our, our uh, chemistry so far will perhaps in indicate 10 to the third to 10 to the six times more basic, and, and we'll see what that may mean. But what we think happens is that as we remove this chloride and as this acetylide, acetylene comes in, it actually is deprotonated by this nitrogen and then a different pathway ultimately comes down to giving us this. At this point, we don't know exactly all of the steps that get to that, but clearly that nitrogen um, changes the chemistry drastically. 
I make a point of saying that there's a clear oil present, and that oil contains lots of chloride. And what isn't noted here is this reaction takes place in dichloromethane. And again, speaking about the high basicity of this nitrogen, if we leave out the T-butyl acetylene, what we've noted is that this nitrogen will actually deprotonate the dichloromethane and start you down a path of generating um, chlorocarbene, which then starts doing all kinds of stuff. And so that just speaks for that, that chemistry quite a bit more. Let's move on to a different type of heteroaromatic. In this case, we'll use furan. Furan, again, adds via a CH bond addition. And once again, only the alpha position, probably due to acidity, adds. And now, in this case, we're back to the same stereochemistry that we saw for the phenyl compound. Again, let's keep this chemistry pretty much the same. Let's remove that chloride in the presence of T-butyl acetylene and see what happens. Now we were really quite surprised. The first time that Hank ran this experiment and came up and said that the hydride was still present, even though in the X-ray crystal structure it's very difficult many times to find hydrogen in the presence of such a huge electron um, metal such as iridium, the NMR spectrum clearly shows that a hydride was still present. And what he was able to demonstrate ultimately through this X-ray crystal structure is that the T-butyl acetylene actually inserted in a very unusual fashion into the metal carbon bond. Now, in terms of the chemistry of metal carbon versus metal hydrogen bonds, the literature tells us that metal hydrogen bonds, hydride has a migratory aptitude usually at least 100 to 1,000 times greater than of metal carbon. So, in any chemistry like this, we would expect, as we have seen before for the phenyl case, that any, if anything, this should have inserted into the metal H bond. The fact that it inserted into the metal C bond was very unusual. What we think is happening in this case is that upon removal of the chloride, as we start to generate a positive charge on the metal center, an heteroaromatic such as this furan can actually participate in stabilizing that positive charge. And via typical organic chemistry arrowing, we can take that lone pair from here and move it around to get a resonance structure in which we have a carbonoid type of an iridium to carbon double bond with that positive charge out on the oxygen. We think that locks it into place so that when we start moving this alkyne in, that actually prevents us from being in a position cis to the hydride. We're only in a position cis to this metal carbon bond. In another step, we think this alkyne rearranges to a vinylidene. This is a step with a great deal of precedent in the literature. And then a migration ultimately gets us to the final point. And then another point is that T-butyl group stabilizes the positive charge through that agostic interaction that I mentioned before. So here we have an electronic structuring that allows us to get to a chemistry that is really unusual. And as a matter of fact, the thing that's nice about this is that if we insert into the metal H bond, end up with a transition metal with two metal carbon bonds, reductive elimination to further products is very difficult, typically, with carbon-carbon bonds in these systems. But a reductive elimination of one metal H and one metal carbon is actually fairly low activation energy. And we've demonstrated that we can do the reductive elimination of this. We haven't closed the loop catalytically, but we can potentially think about the uh, addition of CH bonds now across these types of unsaturates. Back to this idea that we can use electronic structures to tell us something about what's going on. If we take a look at the ground state structures of uh, the um, metal phenyl versus the metal fur furanyl, you can see that already there's perhaps a little bit of an indication that even in the ground state structure, that there is a significant decrease in the bond here between this carbon and the phenyl, which perhaps suggests this multiple bonding <coughs> that exists in this particular state. And concurrent with that, I don't show it here, but there is a longer metal to chlorine bond distance than there is here. So we can get some interesting structural information that can help us to perhaps explain some of the chemistry that we've seen. 
just moving along, and again, I, I am <coughs> admitting that we're glossing over lots of data and lots of things, but I am trying to just kind of give an overview. Let's now move to pyrrolic and indolic compounds. Now, in this case, those that have these NH bonds, we find that, again, we think because of the greater acidity of those, it's only NH addition that takes place. And so we seen both with pyrrole and with indole and with carbazole. And as a matter of fact, now that I remember it, as I go back, this was Fola's work um, in, in looking at some of these additions, is that um, we get these compounds, but now we found that actually it is awfully difficult to get some insertions into either the metal N or the metal H bond. This chloride is very difficult to remove. We, have, we cannot remove that chloride. And again, ground state structures show for nitrogen here, for example, this metal chloride bond is extremely short, which suggests a very, very strong bond. And so we weren't able to get that to take place. But because it has added to the metal in that fashion, that indole becomes actually fairly even more electron rich. The indole C5 ring is already a pretty electron rich metal center. It becomes even more electron rich. And so when we take electron deficient acetylenes, they actually very rapidly uh, undergo Michael chemistry at this particular point in very <coughs> high yield. And so even though we didn't get metal H or metal N chemistry, we still affected the chemistry out of the ring. Well, finally, to add the last bit of heteroaromatic chemistry, especially when we looked at that furan chemistry, we were interested in this idea that if that oxygen was stabilizing our positive charge, perhaps sulfur would do a better job at stabilizing that positive charge, and that maybe we could even isolate that type of intermediate that has that positive charge out on sulfur. So if we take a look at thiophenes and, and the like, and their reaction with that compound, we discover that we see no CH activation chemistry, but rather, whether it's sulfur or selenium in this particular case, we actually break into the aromatic ring, and we make this new six-membered ring in which we've added across a carbon sulfur or a carbon selenium bond. This is probably not a very good model system for hydrodesulfurization chemistry, but it's believed that this type of chemistry may actually be taking place in hydrodesulfurization. So even though this is an aromatic system, even more aromatic than is furan when it comes down to it, because of the greater interaction between iridium and sulfur and iridium and selenium, we can break into this aromatic system and get to that type of a new six-membered ring. Probably our most intriguing chemistry came about in that light, is that if we use a heteroaromatic such as thiazole, which contains both sulfur and nitrogen, again, we get extremely high yields of a carbon-sulfur cleavage reaction. We get exclusive um, CS cleavage at this bond that is next to the nitrogen. And we've actually looked at lots of different substituents. And so this, this kind of cleavage reaction of breaking into that carbon-sulfur bond is generally Again, what's very intriguing here is that upon breaking this open, in thiazole itself, this nitrogen is so weakly basic as to not really even be a base. As soon as we break this open and insert the iridium, we get about a 10 to the 6-fold increase in basicity and nucleophilicity of that nitrogen. So this compound is a very, very strong nucleophile, which we discovered one more time by using a solvent like dichloromethane we actually have a crystal structure, which I didn't bring today, which is actually a compound in which we have two of these bridged by a CH2, because this compound reacted with the dichloromethane to quaternize um, using um, both chlorines to give a CH2 bridge across two of those compounds. So what we've seen today is quite a variety of different chemistries that we could observe with different aromatics and heteroaromatics. Ultimately, what we would like to do is to use some of this chemistry for some very unusual catalysis. And we think that there is some alkyne and some olefin catalysis still in here that we have yet to uncover. 
and we're going to continue to work on that. We think there is some very unique chemistry with some of these heterocycles in terms of using these heterocycles in further chemistry, and we still hope to work a little bit more on those. But I think that what we've tried to show is that these electron-rich iridium complexes display a wide variety of bond-making and bond-breaking reactions. We have shown catalysis for BH addition. Even though hydroboration is not a chemistry that you think of that needs catalysis, certainly a lot of hydroborating reagents will undergo BH addition without the need for a catalyst. A catalyst gives you the opportunity to change regio and stereo selectively. So we've actually demonstrated some very interesting catalysis there. We've seen that we've actually can make some, um, what, what I didn't talk about today, is we can add carboxylic acids to the transition metal and add that to olefins or in acetylenes in a catalytic fashion. But I think that we can also show that the kinds of chemistry that we see here, if not models, is maybe too good a word, but perhaps food for thought for other homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis systems, because we can see some very intriguing reactions, some very intriguing structures that perhaps we can think about in other systems where they may not be so amenable to isolation. But we think that many of these systems can be ultimately useful as homogeneous catalysts in their own right. So once again, I'd like to thank all the students who participated in this chemistry over the years and for their, their fine work. I'd like to thank the you for the opportunity to participate in this symposium and you diehards who are interested in homogeneous catalysis for attending this session. So thank you very much. <laughs>
We haven't done that because one of the things that we are extremely interested in, and what Marion is going to talk a great deal about today, is we're actually very interested in aqueous catalysis and water soluble chemistry. And so once we go beyond trimethylphosphine, we lose in some systems water solubility. And so we really haven't even looked at any of those kinds of things. Your general, general scheme that you're looking at, you take the complex and add your EH group and then remove chlorine. Is it possible to make the chlorine more labile on the original compound and then add your EH group to get more reactivity out of the, the ones that you're stuck in? Right. One of the things that we are, we're, we're looking on, again, you'll, you'll see that strategy in the next talk, is to use other anionic groups um, that are less tightly held. And oxygen donors, because of the mismatch between the third row of iridium and the very small oxygen, uh, is much more labile. And so we found that even carboxylates are much more labile, and we've had some success there. Marion's going to show you that triflates are wonderful in that way. And so, yeah, we've looked at chemistry now, and we're going to start ramping up in some other cases of using triflate <coughs> as an anion. But we can't use it necessarily at that first step because even though I didn't talk about it, it appears that the nucleophilicity of whatever that anion is, is important in that CH or other EH addition step. So for example, when we've tried BF4, for example, as a, as a counter ion in that first material, the COD, iridium, tristrimethylphosphate, it doesn't do any of the CH or EH addition chemistry. So we think the chloride plays an important role somewhere along that scheme, and but once it's on there, then we can remove it, replace it with something like triflate, and then we're on to some better chemistry. Okay, Joe, thanks very much.